Hey, you guys, Erin and Dusty here at Eat, Move, Rest. Mm -hmm. And tonight we are interviewing our good friend, Dr. Will Bolshewitz. He yep. is the author of the bestseller, Fiber Fueled. And we're super excited because his follow-up book has just released the Fiber Fueled Cookbook. Right. So we've got ourselves a copy. We absolutely <laughs> love it. We've been diving into the recipes. <laughs> It's and already like earmarked. Aaron's got it all like bookmarked and folded <laughs> and like highlighted already. I'm like, oh my gosh, you've already gotten to work on this thing. <laughs> you know, that's like as an author, that's the ultimate compliment is when totally. people like you start beating up your book. That, you know, <laughs> if the book looks too clean and it looks like you just bought it at the store, then it's like, you know, right. am I supposed to really believe that you've read my book? <laughs> <laughs> I know, totally. Exactly. You need a little, a few uh, curry stains on it but yeah <laughs> exactly so yeah we're really excited to get to chat with you here and share all of your wisdom with our eat move rest audience and we did pull a bunch of questions from yep. our um, friends and followers over on instagram so maybe we can dive into those in a little bit totally but i just have to say like first and foremost like I've been plant, we've been plant-based for about seven or eight years now, yep. but if this book would have come out at the beginning of that, like this honestly would have been like my, my Bible, like totally. it would have been right next to the Bible on my nightstand because I was fiber obsessed. Oh, like, that's just, it was this very is weird. weird. <laughs> yeah. This is weird because Aaron has had this fiber obsession since we got together, even before we were on a plant-based diet, you were still fiber obsessed, but she wasn't healthy fiber obsessed. She was at the time it was like Activia yogurts and like fiber one bars. Processed, <laughs> it, was, it was fiber processed. one everything. Like when yeah. fiber one was, became a thing, I was like fangirl, you know? Yeah. And it all stemmed from like a very, very slow digestion yep. and yep. it really affected my mood. And that was the worst part of it because nobody's happy if they're not regular. <laughs> and, and so honestly, you know, I was just checking every single, you know, processed package, like lean cuisine or whatever yep. I was buying, um, checking the label to find out the grams of fiber in it. And years later, I'm looking back and I'm like, you know, most of the foods that have the most fiber don't even have like a nutrition label on them it's right. just in the produce section totally. you know and i was looking in all of the wrong places and i was just so paranoid making sure that i got 30 grams and then i was okay but now it's like since going plant-based you don't even have to think about it or question it you're just guaranteed to get above and beyond <laughs> that totally so you know i love this because uh first of all you were way ahead of the curve because <laughs> I'm still trying to convince people that fiber is relevant. Right. I'm like, how much, how much more do we need to prove that fiber matters? Like, I, how is it that I still hear people say that there is no human requirement for fiber? I mean, I guess like there's no human requirement for fiber, but if you don't eat fiber, you're like increasing your risk of six of the top 10 causes of death. Crazy. Yeah. Why would you do that, right? Totally. So, and then the other thing that you bring up, Aaron, that I think is such a, a, an important sort of jumping off point that we can cover, um, you know, in more detail if you guys want to, is that I, I feel like we um, have stigmatized bowel movements where we're not allowed to talk about it. We're not supposed to be comfortable talking about it. It's supposed right. to be this private thing that, and you wouldn't believe how many people like Dusty and Aaron, you, you wouldn't believe how many people I have met professionally where they literally are an adult in their 30s. Yeah. Before they discover that they have a pooping issue. <laughs> because they just thought like, that's normal. That's my right. normal, right? right. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not until they get married, and they move in with someone, and yeah. then they discover, oh, wait, like, I'm pooping once every six days. Right. This person How is pooping twice a day. There? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that is one of the top questions we got was, Number one, is there an upper limit to fiber and piggybacking off of that? Like what is regular when it comes to pooping? Is yeah. it once a day, twice a day, once a week? Like, I think a lot of people don't know. I think yeah, it's so, that you mentioned ahead, that too, talking about it. It's so funny. We talk about it so much. <laughs> Our families get freaked out. They're like, you guys talk about poop so much. Like, <laughs> We're just open about our poop. Well, and I think it's when like, you have two tiny my kind of people, it's like yeah. anything goes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, very so true. I'm, and I'm saying, yeah, how much, yeah. too much, what's regular? 
Um, okay, so when it comes to fiber, um, it, fiber is like anything else. There, there's always such a thing as too much of a good thing. Yeah. Th th that's always possible, right? Yeah. So exercise is great. We need more exercise. Yeah. Like, but you can you can overdo it. Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if if you rolled out of bed and you hadn't been working out and you go to the gym and you go so hard. Yeah. You're gonna be in pain for about two weeks totally. taking ibuprofen, right? Yeah. So um, the same is true with with fiber, which is that this is a very personal thing. There's not a number. Yeah. Um, it really depends on you and what your body is adjusted or adapted to. So like the more you practice fiber, the better your body will become at processing fiber sure. and getting the most out of it and giving you more benefits from it. Yep. Um, but most of us have not been really consuming fiber. Like even in the U S it's kind of interesting. Like when people think that they are high fiber consumers, yep. you actually most of the time discover that there's still less than the minimum recommended amount of fiber. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so it, it really is, it's about meeting you where you are. Where, yep. What have you been doing for the last couple of months? Okay, cool. Like this is our baseline. Yep. And now let's practice just like with exercise. Let's practice. Let's do a little bit more. Let's start turning it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not go too hard, too fast all at once. Cause that's how you hurt yourself. Right. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of bowel movements, um, so how often you go, uh, correct me if I have the wrong question here, but like how often you have a bowel movement is not the only thing that I could really care about, to be honest with you. Let me kind of give you some of the ways that I'm thinking about bowel movements because it's sort of a more complex, more multifaceted thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm the guy who like spends all day thinking about bowel movements. So <laughs> please don't judge. <laughs> um, so yes, how often you go does matter. Yeah. If you poop once a week, you're constipated. Yeah, I, I actually don't need any additional information. We're yeah. done there. <laughs> okay. Um, but the problem is that there are people who poop every day. Yeah, they can still be constipated. Yeah, there are people who poop five times a day. Yeah, but it's not a big bowel movement. It's yeah, like a, little, a little nugget or a little turd. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they're working so hard. They're grunting, not to be too graphic, but they're you know they're pushing and they're working. Yeah just to get this little nugget to come out. Yeah. And they never get that. Like, it's really important to have that good, complete, satisfactory release. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. And the, all right. So that, right no, that's what You're kept turning that, her is, on. that was one of the biggest things that kept me plant based was if that's happening regularly and it feels great in the morning, then your <laughs> mood also feels better. Totally. <laughs> I mean, it's totally. it so true. Look, and the, the food mood thing. It's true. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like this when people say people are anal retentive, they actually are anally retentive. It's not just an expression. They're, they're actually anally retentive. Yeah. So um, I do think, I do think that like having a good, healthy, complete evacuation early in the day is, one of the best ways to start a day and it really sets you up for success totally. so, but the the completeness becomes a very important part of this like this was one of my little tricks as a medical doctor that i want to transfer on to people through my education is that you know it's not just how often you go it's was it a complete bowel movement because if you are not completely evacuating you could go and let's pretend you go but you get 70 percent out yeah right yeah so you think you got it but there's still some there that 30% is like compound interest in the bank, but not right. in the way that you want it to be right, Yeah, <laughs> right? not paying dividends, but instead yeah. what it does is in a couple of days, it's causing symptoms. Totally. And the number one symptom of, of uh, constipation is gas and bloating. Right. All right. So there's a lot of ways that constipation can present. Uh, fatigue is very common. You can have pain anywhere in your abdomen, around your belly button, one of the corners, like upper abdomen, lower abdomen. It could be any of those places. Yeah. You can also get like nausea. Yeah. Like not, you don't actually throw up. Yeah. But you do feel queasy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You lose your appetite. You get full very quickly. Yeah. You might even exacerbate acid reflux. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you may, not, you may not connect the acid reflux to your constipation, but it is actually connected interesting yeah and well because um dusty the 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 gut 
is like think of it as a conveyor belt sure yeah right yeah and it's designed to move forward totally and if in the back end of the conveyor belt there's a breakdown yeah and things are not moving yeah then you cannot continue to move forward with the conveyor belt makes you sense. gotta shut it down makes right? sense well, it's, what happens? Our juicer too, you know. Yeah, like yeah. sometimes you have to hit the reverse button, and things start to come back up in order to get it to go through. Like it gets stuck. Right. right if poop comes out of your mouth, you really have a problem. <laughs> I'm, you know, but I'm saying like that would plugs, be the worst. Like, it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was like, I had a graphic like Stephen yeah. King in my mind. I was like, okay, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight after that one. <laughs> that would be a first. So, um. And, you know, I, I think that the other thing, too, is that there are people who I hope that there's someone who's listening who benefits from this. Mm -hmm. There are people who will get diarrhea. And it's a very weird thing because your doctor will totally miss it. Yeah. And, and you will almost certainly miss it, too, unless you like, you know, hear this and you're looking for it. Yeah. These are people who suffer with chronic constipation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, boom, one day. Yeah they're having diarrhea and it's watery, it's explosive, it's urgent. Yeah. Right. But they still have a lot of gas and bloating. Yeah. Gas and bloating is a classic constipation symptom. Yeah. And so in these people, what they have is what's called overflow, overflow diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And if you were to take an x-ray, what you would see is that the, the stool is actually impacted. It's stuck. The solid stuff is backing up. Yeah. And then the liquid sneaks through the cracks and the crevices and the liquid yeah. comes down to the bottom. And then like when liquid gets to our bottom, it's, it's going to be urgent diarrhea because we're just not designed for that. Right, mm -hmm. right. So this is where it's like having this awareness of being in tune. Like when you are in rhythm, you basically know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you are out of rhythm, you basically know it, but you may not be paying attention. Right, yeah. right, yeah makes sense and if you can pay attention to this we want to get you back in rhythm because when you're in rhythm the body thrives this is totally. the way that your guys meant to work totally that makes sense so a lot of people um in our audience may not even be fully plant-based or they, they might be aspiring to it but they always get caught up on the gas and the bloating especially when it comes to beans oh, man. so how can we get our people onto right. the beans and have them work for them because a lot of our recipes have beans in them. <laughs> totally, that's yeah, totally. what you get like every day, whether we're talking about poop or not. I guess this is more of a gut question, obviously. But yeah, what's up with beans and bloating? And does it mean they're bad? Or it's like- It's gotta be the lectins. It's yeah, gotta, gotta be the lectins. The lectins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, actually, please stricken that from the record for the, all the listeners at home. Right. It's not the lectins, <laughs> I can assure you it is not. Right. Um, all right. So the, the deal is, first of all, before we even come to the beans, let's first take a step back. If you have food intolerances, the first question has to be, why are you having food intolerances? Yeah. What's the root of the problem? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you have constipation, not to make this entire thing about constipation, because there are other things, but this fits so perfectly right here. Mm -hmm. If you have constipation and you eat a lot of beans, you're going to be super bloated. Yeah. And you'll blame the beans. Right. But I'm here to tell you that I think it's actually the constipation. Makes sense. Because mm -hmm. if you could get poop in and get into that rhythm and keep things moving forward, then what you're going to find is the gas and bloating is going to go away. Mm -hmm. Food intolerances are going to go away. And your ability to process and digest foods that you don't think you really can process and digest, you're going to be shocked at how easy these become. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So step one is always like, is there something holding me back? Mm -hmm. Don't just jump right to the food. Start here first. Ask these questions. What is the root of the problem? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then once you get beyond that, when we get to the food, let's talk about the beans. The beans are the ultimate microbiome food. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they have um, fiber and resistant starches mm -hmm. and polyphenols, mm -hmm. all of which are prebiotic, meaning food for your microbiome, mm -hmm. and therefore good for your not only gut health, good for your health throughout your entire body. Mm -hmm. This is why beans legumes are like people who eat more beans, they live longer, they have less heart disease, they have less cancer. Yep. Awesome. But the problem is that coming back to these prebiotic foods, the fiber, yeah, resistant starches, 
but we don't actually have the digestive enzymes to break them down. Mm -hmm. Who does? Our microbes. Right. Our microbes right. can break these down. Yeah. We're asking them to do the work. And when you're asking them to do the work, if they're in a state of impairment, meaning that they have been damaged or hurt, yeah, mm -hmm. it's hard for them to do that. Sure. Right. Like yeah. if I have a bum shoulder, it's hard for me to lift things over my head. Right. 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 Yeah. So, um, so if you have a damaged gut, you should expect that the foods that are actually the best for your gut microbiome because they have the most fiber, yeah, or resistant starches are also going to be the foods that you're going to struggle with the most yep. to consume because those are the ones that are actually asking the gut microbiome to do the most work. And when you do the most work, this is the stress test. Totally. Can they keep up? Can they hold up? And if your gut's not in a great place, yeah. you may have symptoms because of that. Totally. What, what can we do with legumes? Here's a couple of things. Um, you, first of all, if you buy them in a can, mm -hmm. right, then you should rinse them uh, extensively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you buy them in bulk, you should soak them overnight. Yeah. And then discard the water, mm -hmm. add some more water, and then discard again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason for both of these, whether it's rinse, 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 or whether it's soak, uh, wash, soak, is that there's a compound called raffinose, mm -hmm. actually good for us, but it also is very gas producing. And mm -hmm. if you get a lot of gas, I say, get rid of it. Yeah. And the way you get rid of it is with water because it's called water soluble, which means that when you add water to beans, you will suck up the raffinose yeah. and then you discard that water and you are getting rid of that raffinose. Okay. Yeah. So that's one of the tricks. Yeah. And then um, you can also pressure cook your beans. Pressure cooking seems to make them more uh, easily digestible for that's people. That's what we've been doing. Yeah. Yep. You can sprout your beans or legumes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you're not sprouting, you need to, this is not just for you two, but for everyone. <laughs> right, yeah. You're sprouting, you need to. So uh, sprouting is like literally the most nutritious food. Yeah. It's a gift from nature because you can basically have a garden in your kitchen. Right. Mm -hmm. Taking up almost no space. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you take a half of a cup of lentils. Yeah. Which may cost you 25 cents. Uh -huh. Yeah. In three days, that half of a cup of lentils turns into four cups of lentil sprouts. Yeah. Awesome. It's amazing. Were even, you, were, did you go live with Doug recently? Doug Evans? I did. I went I went live with Doug yesterday. Oh, and yesterday. I, I was, was going to have done a cu couple things together because we're big we're big sprout people. So Yeah, oh, we had him on our channel a while we back. We had him on a while back. And now, again, we're moving in a week. So I'm hacking up the house. I have a tote full of supplies from <laughs> Doug all of our sprouting gear and i'm like we've got to get back into this yep i got pregnant i had major aversions to <laughs> all kinds of basically green leafies and yep. i just wasn't into it i don't know why but well, i was getting my nutrition months. in through smoothies i was able to make a green smoothie and mask it with some fruit and it was great yep. and that brings me to another thing that i heard you say um that a child's taste can be acquired in the womb based on what the mother is eating. Totally. I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. So, yeah, I, I mean, so a quick example, I, I'd be curious to hear because you guys have um, your family, but like my son, who's five, mm -hmm. my wife was smashing broccoli sprouts during pregnancy. Yeah. And because my it's the kind of person that if you tell her that something's good, she's going to yeah. keep going back to the well. <laughs> like she'll yeah. just keep doing it. Yeah. So she heard broccoli sprouts are good. So she's like, let's smash them every single day. Yeah. And um, so Liam came out and when he turned six months old, we started giving him food. Yeah. And we're like, you know what? What the heck? Let's, let's put some broccoli sprouts on the tray and see what this kid does. <laughs> yeah. and they're so bitter. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's hard to convince even an intelligent adult that you should eat these. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just like, ah, he's grabbing them. He's throwing them in his mouth. And yeah. he's, he kept doing this. He didn't stop. He loved them. Right. How can you explain? How can you possibly explain this other than he, he inherited yeah. my wife's taste buds, either through the microbiome or through breast milk? Those are the two options that I see.
Yeah, totally. that's I, pretty we, amazing. We fully agree. Well, our little guy, Max, eats our super spicy curry. In fact, we made it last night, our yellow curry, favorite thing. And it was too spicy for me. Like I've had to acquire yes. taste for this. Yes. Aaron has taken it down through every pregnancy <laughs> and our kids wolf it down. That's like, actually it's what. Just no thing. <laughs> this is super <laughs> impressive, Aaron. Yeah. yeah, they say to eat spicy food to induce labor. And I we did have a spicy curry on the night Max was born. <laughs> but <Yep>. yeah, <laughs> I totally. But seriously, so, I totally believe that that they can inherit that, you know, not just the well, you, you talk about like the benefits of vaginal births and all these things for kids and, and the gut and how this is all like tied together. I fully believe that. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, another thing that that's making me think of is a lot of people are just like, well, I just don't like vegetables or I just don't like kale. I want that green smoothie, but I don't like kale. And we're always trying to encourage them because from what we've heard to our knowledge, like you can acquire a taste for foods and your taste buds actually change because your gut flora changes. Is all of this true? Totally. Yeah, this is actually definitely true. But the other thing that I would say is like if for, so first of all, I love that your community is not necessarily exclusively plant-based because these are the people that I love talking to the most. Yeah. Because um, talking to people who are already plant-based, I'm like, I'm preaching to the choir. What's the point? You know? Right, right. So, but no disrespect to plant-based people. Thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> but like in my book, The Fiber Fields Cookbook, one of the things from my perspective is that I believe that we all deserve to have food that we love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that you should not be required to compromise on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that many people fear that if they go towards a plant-based diet, they're going to be eating cardboard. Right, right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or like, you know, the, the equivalent of that is like raw kale with no dressing or anything else. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And that's not true. Right. We have food from around the world. If you look at all the cultures from across the globe, pick a country that you love. Yeah. And there are ways in which they're like the, the core, the foundation of that delicious food is plant-based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I'm doing in the, in the fiber fields cookbook is that like, we wanted to take people on a culinary world tour. Oh yeah. Yeah. From your kitchen. Right. Like you don't have to leave. You just literally do it here. And like, you could go to Spain and have paella right. and there's, a, there's the Greek salad and then there's the pozole in Mexico. And yeah. then there's like the, the gado gado bowl from Indonesia. Yeah. And there's the, the, the um, uh, sweet and spicy peanut tempeh wraps, lettuce wraps from Thailand. Like right. go across the, the globe and every single place we're going to land the plane. We're going to jump off. We're going to eat some street food. Right. Mm -hmm. it's delicious. Yeah. yeah. That's right. awesome. And then come back home. And oh. so, so that to me is like when you are transitioning. Yeah. Don't feel the need to move towards the food that you perceive to be the most nutritious. Right. Yeah move towards the food that you perceive to be the most delicious right right <laughs> and then continue to move in this that's direction right. yeah and your taste buds will come along for the ride yeah, yeah so that's actually one of the questions we i had on instagram was that is there like a formula in your book for doing that like working your way up like baby steps in that's no joke somebody asked me that on instagram and like you said, I think that's a perfect way. And in fact, flipping through, we were we saw that you do sort of have a way to like introduce people if they do have sensitivities or anything like that to kind of ease in. Yeah. So can you explain I um, what exactly a low histamine diet is and a low FODMAP diet? Because we saw that you have protocols for both to kind of get people back to, you know, baseline so they can enjoy all of the foods in the plant. Yeah, game. totally. Well, you know, so let's start with the FODMAPs because it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with legumes. Legumes contain a lot of FODMAPs. Um, so do, I'm going to name some foods and you can think about how, like, whether or not these are foods that affect you as an individual. Yep. Um, and, uh, and you can think about like, you know, hey, these are the foods that are FODMAP foods. So like legumes are classic, but there's also um, whole grains, wheat, uh, onions, garlic, uh, dairy products, if you consume dairy um fruit so like fructose containing foods okay so these these are the foods that contain these fodmaps fodmaps are the fermentable parts of our foods yeah. mm -hmm. um the carbohydrates 
they're actually good for our gut microbes. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the FODMAPs are prebiotic, meaning they feed the gut microbes. So like in legumes, these parts that I'm saying are um, requiring more work from your gut microbes are also the parts that turn out to be good for the gut microbes and they're the FODMAPs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you, it's not that these foods are bad, they're not. Yeah. It's that if you have a damaged gut, you're asking your gut to do more work. Right. Okay. Right. That which can sense. expose that damaged gut because that's where you kind of manifest the symptoms. Cause you can't, your gut can't keep up with what you're asking. Totally. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Even like you said, relaying that to like exercise. Well, if you're not working your shoulders out, you can't expect to go into the gym and put 35 pounds above your head 10 times. Like you need to ease in, you need to start that, that process of, you know, working that muscle out, or in this case, working your gut out before you start throwing these heavy hitting foods at them. Dusty, that is exactly right. But let me even take it one step further. Cause, cause that, that analogy that you're using is perfect. Mm -hmm. but you're starting from this you're taking the starting point of having a healthy shoulder and not working out but what if you got a bum shoulder right mm -hmm. right right so what if you can't even lift your arm over your head right mm -hmm. yeah right are you going to stop using your arm for the rest of your life yeah no yeah. you're not you're going to rehab it and rehabbing it involves starting with small simple motions and maybe there is some discomfort in this process it's not a ton but yeah. there may be some and you're working your way towards lifting your arm above your head. And then you're going to go towards like literally one pound. Totally. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but if you do this one pound, two pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds, and the next thing you know, you've worked your way back to full strength yeah, uh -huh. and you're throwing 35 pounds over your head. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yep. this is, this is the process for training your gut. And this is something that you can totally do with FODMAPs. And in this book, I will teach you how to do it. Yeah. Histamines are super interesting because this is like, I feel, oh, so I am not the first book to, to cover FODMAPs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a reliable source, mm -hmm. right? I have my way of doing it. Yeah. And I think my way is helpful, but I'm not the first one to do this. I'm not breaking new ground. Yeah. But with histamine intolerance, I kind of feel like I'm breaking new ground. I'm not literally the first person ever to write a book about histamine intolerance, but I'm, I think I'm probably the most reliable source that's ever been written. I have 90 references in this one chapter. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so histamine intolerance is important for people to know because your doctor may not make these connections for you. Mm -hmm. So it becomes important for you to actually become empowered with the knowledge to actually make these connections yourself. Sure. So because the symptoms of histamine intolerance, histamine is a, a signaling molecule in the body, mm -hmm. which basically means like it like enters into it, it will basically insert itself into receptors and, you know, start different things from uh, to start happening in the body. Mm -hmm. We all have histamine. Yeah, mm -hmm. we all have it. I have it right now in my blood. Yeah. Okay. But if it falls out of balance, when it's like a spike, when it's way too much. Yeah then you start overstimulating those receptors mm -hmm. and then you get a problem. Yeah. And so what I want to do with your audience is I want to share the symptoms of histamine intolerance. And the exercise here is for everyone to think about, do you have two of these symptoms? Yeah. So it's a yes, no question. Do you have two of these questions, two of these symptoms? And then at the end, if it's a yes, I'm going to tell you what to do next. Okay. okay? So, the symptoms are number one, number one symptom is gas and bloating. Yep. Okay. You can have other digestive symptoms. You can have reflux, nausea, uh, abdominal discomfort or cramping. Yep. Um, diarrhea, constipation. But then let's go outside the gut because histamine can affect your whole body. Sure. You could have a headache, migraine, runny nose, yep. sinus issues, congestion, sore yep. throat. Um, on the skin, you could have a rash, hives, flushing or redness. Yep. You, could have, you could have itching. Yep. And then the heart, you could have lightheadedness, racing heart rate, um, uh, fatigue. Um, so these are the symptoms. Okay. Yeah. As you can see, like you go to see me as a gastroenterologist, 
Yeah. You come in and I'm like, okay, so tell me what brings you here. And you're like, okay, I'm so I'm having bloating and I'm having this runny nose. I'm like, oh, runny nose. You're going to have to talk to someone else about that. That's not me. Yeah, yeah. I'm just the, I'm just the bloating guy, right? Yeah. Well, here's the problem. We need to connect these dots. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is a whole body thing, not just a one part thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so if the answer is yes, if you have two of these symptoms, it's not that I'm telling you that you do have histamine intolerance. But what I am telling you is you could have histamine intolerance yeah possible yeah so how do we answer that question how do we answer whether or not you do or do not have it yeah okay. unfortunately there's no blood test or poop test yeah or cat scan yeah what you have to do is you have to actually eat a low histamine diet yeah mm -hmm. what is that well <laughs> uh a low histamine diet could be uh, five minute blueberry pear oats could be yeah. sweet potato waffles it could be an autumn kale salad you tell us or, right here yeah exactly yeah. like uh sweet corn and pepper gazpacho or a mango burrito bowl yeah. so a, a, a low histamine diet can be made simple right when you have a cookbook designed to give you a low histamine diet Total, it's is, amazing yeah yeah you know so, why it's extra amazing because I feel like we haven't, I know I haven't heard of this much until like this last year, we've had right. more than one friend who's all of a sudden like in her forties being like, I have to go on this low histamine diet. And we're like, what is that? Mm -hmm. And this is like no joke in the last year, this has, has popped up for us more than once now. And so it's like, and for me too, perfect. I think since becoming a mom, so many people are reaching out because their kids yeah. and babies have like intolerances or al allergies or right. like dusty said this histamine intolerance thing yeah so i think that brings us to another point too um the difference between like an intolerance or a food allergy because these terms get kind of tossed around a lot yeah. and <laughs> it's kind of difficult to what's the difference yeah it's yeah. an important distinction. So a food allergy, I'm going to start with allergy, and then we'll talk about intolerance. A food allergy, by definition, means that you are activating the immune system. Yeah. So if you think about allergies in general, like seasonal allergies, like you get, you know, um, sinus issues, because you're exposed to pollen or pet dander or whatever it may be. Um, with a food allergy, it's exposure to food. Mm -hmm. And there's specific foods that are the classic foods. Fish, shellfish, uh, dairy products, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, corn, soy. Yeah. Okay. So these are the classic foods that can cause a food allergy. And when you have a food allergy, you, it could be the most trivial amount. And it can initiate a very scary reaction in your body that, can, that gets out of control real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is why there's no peanuts on the airplane anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because the person who has that peanut allergy, if they yeah. get exposed, it's bad. It, they're up in the air and it's bad because they need an emergency room like now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So, um, so this is why we don't mess around with that kind of thing. Now, uh, on the flip side of food intolerance, okay, this is a very important foundational um, definition to understand. A food intolerance is when the consumption of some food triggers symptoms that you frankly don't want right right so it could be like with fodmaps with the bloating and gi symptoms could be the histamine with a runny nose or other symptoms headaches uh, skin symptoms so but the point is the food causes symptoms and it does not involve your immune system by right. definition it is not an allergy interesting yeah it's not inflammation yeah <laughs> Because if it was inflammation, it would involve the immune system. Makes sense. It is sloppy digestion. There you go. Your body is struggling. And the majority of the time, not all cases, like if you have celiac disease, the reason that you have that is that's a genetically predisposed issue, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but the majority of cases when people have a food intolerance, it's because there's been damage to their microbiome and their microbiome can't keep up with the, with the demands of the diet. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... I have to say we're at four, we got a four minute warning, Dr. B. <laughs> this sounds like what we need to do then to fix constipation, to fix these intolerances, to fix a lot of this stuff. 
like we're talking about the damaged shoulder, maybe the damaged gut, is fix that gut, heal that gut, fix that microbiome. And the number one way to do that is ding, 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 fiber, right? Am I right? Is it fiber? So you, you are right. And the, so it, it is absolutely fix the gut. Yeah. Right. The problem is not the food and you are not better by eliminating the food. Yeah. You are better fixing the gut so that you can eat that food and not have to fear it. And yep. it stops being your enemy and it becomes yep. your friend. Totally. Right? So, and the way that we fix the gut is um, in the interest of time, it's fully described in this book. Yep. This book is, so I've had so many people who are like, okay, but Dr. B, why did you call it a cookbook? Yeah. <laughs> because it's kind of not, mm -hmm. but it also kind of is. Yeah, it's got 125 recipes, it has full color photography, when you like I have been encouraging people when you get it. Yeah, pretend it's a pretend it's an issue of us weekly, just flip through it, have some fun. Yeah, yeah. kick your feet up, right? Totally. But, but it also has 11 chapters. Yeah. And it has these two food based uh, uh, protocols, low FODMAP, low histamine, yeah. And you work through the 11 chapters. And if you have gut issues, no matter who you are, if you have gut issues, you start at the beginning and you read your way through. Yeah. And I'm walking you through the exact process that I would use with you if we were working together one on one. Right. And um, if you don't have gut issues, here's the thing like, our gut is so important. Right. Mm hmm connected to our digestion, our metabolism, our immune system, our hormones, our brain, our mood, our energy levels. Yeah. Gosh, that is so precious. Totally. Mm -hmm. We need to protect that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And protecting that means a um, making conscious choices All right. to enhance and optimize your gut health. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this book is designed for is like, it's, it doesn't, you don't have to have food intolerances, but if you do, I honestly think this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is the best book for food intolerances ever written. Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't have food intolerances, your gut is so precious is such an important part of your body, your health, your long-term outlook. We need to protect that resource. Mm -hmm. And therefore you should be using the principles in this book and still applying them into your into your life in a way that makes sense to enhance your gut health totally. make it even better. yeah totally. that makes sense it's kind of like our grandparents' idea of working out is oh are you why are you guys trying to lose weight and yeah. they, they just equate <laughs> exercise with wanting to lose weight but yeah. you don't have to have a weight problem to want to exercise and move your body daily. It's still super important right. to maintain the health of your frame and your, your like body. Like you just said, so, whether you have that intolerance mm -hmm. or not, like this is something, I'm no joke. This is gonna be the first cookbook that I actually read through because I want the information in there so I can learn again, like you said, how to optimize my already healthy gut. Mm -hmm. So I think, right? All that, yeah. Okay, we, if we've got less than a minute. We love you. <laughs> we'll talk to you again soon. We'll continue sharing. We'll blast this out. If you guys have any more questions, put them in the comments below. Find Dr. B on Instagram at Remind go me Health MD. Health MD. Yep. And go, go buy me. the book. <laughs> what else? That's perfect. That's okay. perfect. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out Later, with me. Take care. Yeah, thank have you. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. See y'all. There are three things we all do every day and we could all be doing them better. Eat move and rest we're dusty aaron max olivia and Bo, and we're the stanzix we aspire to live a plant-centric faith-forward healthy lifestyle and welcome all of the adventures that accompany it join us every week as we blend chop juice run lift ride and master our minds in between on the ultimate quest to find better balance deeper connection and true happiness within 